resources and organizational changes sometimes required for good issues management and crisis planning. So we're going to take a few minutes and talk about those. While companies acknowledge value in creating crisis plans, recommended strategies are often just paid lip service. Research has found in practical terms that companies will often agree that they need to have a crisis plan, commission one to be created, and then fail to act to make changes that would actually mitigate risk or improve the company's social obligations to its stakeholders. There may be a lot of reasons cited for this, including a lack of organizational capacity building to ensure that the organization can implement the changes. This can also include internal politics and even simply a lack of urgency. Communications functions still remain undervalued in many organizations. While this is changing and many organizations have realized the vital business function that communication serves to help an organization achieve its KPIs and strategic objectives, its value is often still underestimated. In part, it's about an organization's culture, but in part it's about communications professionals being better advocates for ourselves beyond just marketing and advertising and delivering evidence of ROI. Power struggles over the ownership or crisis-related decision-making can also limit crisis planning. Often in large multinational or even multi-regional organizations, the question of whether crisis planning is a central or a regional function remains a turf battle within some organizations. Schisms of style and communication preference can also limit crisis planning. There are a lot of potential style conflicts and even conflicting recommendations. For example, some communications directors may focus on direct and open communication, and largely this is what stakeholders expect. But corporate leaders may view this as risky, and legal recommendations often focus on concerns of liability, and so there can be limited agreement about the communication approach ahead of time. There also must be a top to bottom and bottom to top understanding and support for crisis planning and response strategy. Beyond the power struggles that may exist at different levels of an organization, it's vital that members from different levels of the organization are involved in, understand, and can enact crisis response strategies. Pang and his colleagues make the point that if line managers don't understand the crisis plan and haven't developed a rapport with the crisis responders within the organization, that there will simply be difficulties. This is in part why he focuses on the complete crisis involving relevant members of an organization to manage the planning from top to bottom. Despite the challenges that we may face, both in terms of the work and resources that it requires to create effective crisis plans, very simply they pay off. Throughout the last 30 years, we've had high visibility evidence that crisis planning not only saves lives, but saves organizational reputations as well. Unfortunately, we also have a lot of evidence that shows that a failure to plan for crises, keep updated crisis plans, and devote resources to crisis planning can also carry great costs. Let's start with the negative. During the congressional hearings of the oil and gas industry's poor crisis preparedness in 2010, what we learned was that even though every major energy company doing business in the Gulf of Mexico had a crisis plan, not a single one of them were up to date. In fact, most of them were pretty similar, like they'd been cut and pasted. Identifying strategies for managing situations in Arctic conditions, addressing the risks to species like walruses, neither of which apply in the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, and actually listing key contacts who had been dead for a number of years. Since 1967, NASA faced its first major crisis with the Apollo 1 mission, where a fire killed three of its crew, and unprepared for the situation, the agency responded poorly, failing to report the deaths, communicating inaccurate and incomplete information, and even purposely misleading Congress, and the media fundamentally damaging the organization's reputation and putting its own mission at risk. So whether we're talking about the Gulf of Mexico or NASA, these are two really good examples of the negative side, the failure to appropriately plan for crisis. 
While NASA's early efforts at crisis planning and crisis response may have been the good, the bad, and the ugly, by 1970, NASA had learned from its past failures, and when an explosion on the Apollo 13 mission threatened the lives of the astronauts, instead of deceiving the public like it had in the past, NASA responded openly and quickly, not only securing political and public confidence in the organization, but ensuring continuing support for space exploration beyond. The same is true with all the hallmark cases and crisis response like the 1982 Tylenol tampering case and a second tampering episode in 1986, where the company's crisis planning and its proactive approach to managing the situation and its communicative response ensured that the damage was minimized for both the company and the consumers. So when executed effectively, crisis planning can even help organizations use the issues management process to make material changes in their organization's practices and proactively communicate to demonstrate issue leadership within an industry. This has been demonstrated in a number of industries, like the American cattle industry example we discussed earlier in the podcasts, where not only had they had planned for the risk of that cow disease, but also an aggressive communication campaign to celebrate their success. But the case that most clearly demonstrated how a company can use issue management to mitigate the impact of crisis and build strong communication strategy around that is Nike. In the 1980s, the biggest athletic footwear companies were targeted for poor labor conditions in Asia. Functionally, they were being accused of turning a blind eye to sweatshop labor conditions. Now, Nike was not the largest footwear company, and when the problem was identified, they asked whether they were also guilty, and it turned out they were. Instead of trying to cover it up, in a 1998 speech, Nike's founder, Phil Knight, announced the company's new initiatives in global manufacturing, acknowledging that they had been a part of the problem, but that they were making fundamental changes. In connecting action and an active campaign strategy, Nike was successful in building the argument that not only was the company committed to being an ethical organization, but that violating international labor standards was simply unacceptable. It didn't stop criticisms of the company, but it certainly mitigated the negative impact while also helping the company to change its business model and ensure that it could be ethical in action and advocacy.